Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Breaking Brews Podcast, a podcast focused on the business side of beer and what's driving today's thriving craft beer industry. Whether you're one of the thousands of people making craft beer what it is today, or just love great beer and want to know more about it, this show is here to cover everything from sales, marketing, branding, culture, and much, much more. The Breaking Brews Podcast delivers real-life scenarios and experiences from industry professionals that will help your beer knowledge evolve. To tap into more great beer content, visit BreakingBrews.com today. And now, the moment you've been waiting for. Let's get this session started. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is time once again to gather around the mic for another installment of the Breaking Brews podcast. I am your host, Jason Sircone, and as I tell you each and every week, if you haven't done so already, jump back in the archives, listen to sessions 1 through 15, then jump over to iTunes and drop me a rating and review, let me know how I'm doing with the podcast, and help the Breaking Brews podcast find the ears of more craft beer lovers just like you. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music, and Spotify. And everything you need to know about the podcast, including subscription links, show notes, and much more, can be found over at breakingbrews.com slash podcast. All right, guys, we are ready to go with session 16 of the show. On this episode, I am joined by the one and only Doug Durda, the host of the Should I Drink That podcast. Doug and I rapped for a long time about the evolution of podcasting. This dude's been doing podcasts since 2006, which I can't remember completely. I, I don't remember much about podcasting at all that far back. So 13 years and going strong, Doug's been a part of the beer community here in the Pittsburgh region and beyond. He tells the story of how Should I Drink That hit the map and how they became popular. Some really funny shit, I got to tell you. It's a great story. You're going to get to hear it on today's show. But we're going to talk about how podcasting has become such an accepted platform for so many folks, so many businesses, so many individuals are using this platform these days. I know I'm happy to be a part of it. I missed podcasting when I was out of the game for a little over a year, and I'm happier than hell to be back with you guys. And podcasting is a lot of fun. If you're thinking about starting one, we're going to drop some tips and knowledge on what you need to know in order to do so successfully. And we went a little long on this episode because we had a lot to talk about. But you know what? I'm paying for this airtime, so all is good. So let's dive in. Session 16 of the Breaking Brews podcast with Doug Durda of Should I Drink That? All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are here with the one and only Douglas Durda, the man who's been doing podcasting since podcasting was cool. <laughs> and, <laughs> I've been doing it for more than two years. Well, in all seriousness, I think you were doing podcasting before it was even a term, right? So let's see. The show started in 2006, May, <laughs> the 5th of May, Cinco, yeah, Cinco de Mayo. 2006, which we did that on purpose because we, we want to have a reason to, to celebrate drinking. So why not do it on the Mexican drinking holiday? Right. The Americanized Logic. drinking holiday. <laughs> uh, so we, were, we actually started, or I should say I started in 2003 on a server through, oh, geez, I'm trying to think back to the name. I used to know this with. Um, Sorg and I had these things, Shoutcast, and it was software that you could get, I believe, through Winamp or one of those groups at the time. There's so many things were bought and sold back in the early days. You're probably th you're throwing out all these terms where everybody's like, what the fuck what, is that? What the hell is he talking <laughs> What's about? What's a Winamp? So Shoutcast server was the software that you could have running on your machine, and you would load up a playlist and play, and you could be a DJ, and it would live stream out your music. Uh, you would get it on most, at the time, Winamp was the big... Uh, was the big MP3 player, so you would tune in and you Clark's music. Which, if you're not from Pittsburgh, you probably don't know who the Clark's are, but they've been they were in some Toyota they, commercials a few years back. That they were in a uh, right they up. were or was that local Toyota? That might I have believe been local that was Toyota. local Toyota, but they were also the theme song to the Pens a few years ago, and they, they were also, also a local channel. <laughs> and, and, yeah, you folks outside and, of Pittsburgh have no clue. <laughs> but those of you outside of Pittsburgh might remember when Anna Nicole Smith had a reality TV show. 
they were the, I believe, the closing song, I think, to her show. Better I, Off Without You. Oh, was, yeah. Was their song. That's right. Don't quote me on that. I have to go. I haven't seen that show in probably 10 years. I don't think that show's been on television in over I, 10 years. Well, depends Has how it? long she's been dead. I mean, she's. Yeah, valid. They, yeah, they never did show it after she passed it, though. Well, we, we are three minutes deep and completely off <laughs> off track. <laughs> that uh, happens. That happens with me. <laughs> so, the uh, yeah, the show started in 2006, and it came around because uh, Sick Puppy and I, my former co-host, we worked together in IT out in Cranberry, and people would come up to us and say, well, you guys aren't drinking Bud Coors Miller. What do we drink? I'm like, well, here's what we like. And we had heard about podcasting. Uh, it came from... Me watching uh, G4 Tech TV back in the day with uh, screensavers and Kevin Rose had all these things going on. I was a big fan of theirs, and they started talking about podcasting. I'm like, I'm an AV guy. I could probably get into something like this. And Sick Puppy's like, well, I'm a tech guy, so let's let's see what we can do. And we hang out any see what happens. So our first show was done at his house in Butler at the time. And we recorded on two laptops with a webcam, like the old school webcam too, not the actual thing that says webcam, like across the little eyeball thing uh we had that with um with those five dollar mics that you got at staples with the long arms on it i think everyone had one in like the late 90s early 2000s so we recorded the first show off that dedicated it to cinco de mayo because we're like mexican drinking holiday why not let's try this and had a good time we picked up some mexican beers from uh three sons dogs and suds out in wexford which is also no longer around you're gonna hear that a lot <laughs> Oh, that place isn't dirty. This is like the museum of podcasts, this episode. This We're is just the, going back to all these things that are no longer around. Which is the most Pittsburgh thing I could do. Yeah, over there where Three Sons used to be. Ain't there no more. Yeah, if you hit the hills, you've <laughs> gone too far. So we would always go there to pick up our beers, and then we said, well, we need liquor with it, so let's get tequila, which was a oh, very bad always idea. Always a wise decision. But we're, we were young. We didn't know any better. <laughs> I mean, we needed the money. So we we did the first show. We did the first few shows. And yeah, it took off like right away. And at the time, there wasn't a lot of podcasts that were out. But we were the only ones doing consistent shows. The other shows would do it like once a month or, or whatever. But we were doing it almost every week or every two weeks. So that got us a lot of listeners right away. But the only people that were on iTunes really... And you're going to notice this with a lot of technology... Most of the first adapters or adopters or whatever you want to call them, the first adopters of technology are usually beer drinkers. Beer and food people are the first ones to take community, like video gamers too. Mm -hmm. So most of your first shows, if you go to iTunes, are beer drinkers, people talking about video games or, or geek stuff, and food. I've never gone back. I mean, I guess there's really no way to go back and search a show to see when it, like, I can't search by year, in other words, like. What podcast, right? I can't do that on iTunes. I've, I've also never tried, so I guess I'm asking a You could go back uh, to see. Well, it should say when they started, uh, depending on their catalog, If you once you hit 300 shows, it starts cutting it. So you have to watch how many shows you have out there because iTunes won't list them after so many. So if I, mean, I haven't done that many, so I, you don't have to worry about mine, but it, there's other shows that do a show every week. So they're like Sorg has uh, Awesome Cast, which is I think in the 400s now. So anything there. anything below, it basically truncates it at like three three hundred. No shows. kidding. I, I've never had a podcast run that long. Either, well, a lot of so the feed, I... that's the way a lot of the feeds are set up. Uh, I don't know if it, that's strictly an iTunes thing now. A lot of stuff has changed because of the fact there are longer shows that have that have been going on. Uh, but it, for a while there, it was like it would only list up to three hundred entries for it, mm -hmm. which I don't have that problem. <laughs> Hopefully, here on the Breaking Bruce podcast, we have that problem at some point, but it's going to take a years so you'd be amazed how fast keep, that can go though keep supporting the show and we'll see what happens the reason doug has joined me here and this is actually the first studio production and doug can attest my very small and coming together slowly studio here at casa circone i'm drinking a glass of vodka right now it is 9 30 in the morning so yes i'm on the tequila You've turned me. You've made me a believer. <laughs> but I had Doug join me today because, as you all know, because you're listening to a beer podcast, there are a lot of beer podcasts out there. And in general, podcasting has really grown to massive levels. And I can even I remember I don't remember what platform it was, Doug, but I remember us talking about this a while back, a few years ago, even of 
is podcasting going to be this medium that everybody clings to in the mainstream? And I think we can both agree that, yeah, that's that's happened. Because there's so many... Basically, if you like something, you can go on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, and find a podcast for it. Somebody's doing some form of content creation on this platform for whatever you love. And we love beer. And I I mean, I followed in this guy's footsteps. Should I drink? <laughs> that was probably the first podcast I ever listened to, period. And here I am now, now into the, you know, the fourth podcast attempt that, are, that I'm, <laughs> uh, that I'm running with. But let's wrap about that a little bit, man. So I know that and this is actually, before we even get into details, I want you to tell the story of how, like, what was the big moment that put, should I drink that on the map? <laughs> yes, man. I'm making you tell this story. <laughs> oh, all right. Our original plan was we were only going to do 10, maybe 11 episodes. We just wanted something to do. And there were, we were friends with a lot of the, the craft beer podcasts that were out there. It's, it was a close community. There wasn't a lot of us. I, we like to joke and say there was hundreds of thousands of craft beer podcasts. The guys who were pretty regular with it, a lot, we were all friends. And I'm still friends with a lot of these guys today. And in fact, a lot of the drinking podcasts. So we were learning from them basically like what we should do for a show. And we're like, well, maybe we'll, we'll keep this going. We don't know what's going to happen. And the best advice we got was just hit record to see what happens. So we started doing that. And we noticed that we got a lot of great feedback from people. And it, that wasn't something we were expecting. So we started like a, back in the day, you had to have forums because we didn't, there was, social media wasn't very big. So we had forums set up. And uh, I think it was like PP, was it PHP, BB, or something like that. So we had the software running, and people were leaving us a lot of great comments about stuff we should do. So we thought about it. I'm like, let's make this really interactive with, with our fans. I go, we have fans. Oh, my God. Even if it's 10, we've got fans. So the rule of the show was if there's a beer that we don't like, we chug it because nothing is ever drain worthy. And that can backfire on you fast. Because there's a few shows where we chugged a lot of beers. But we always thought it's kind of disrespectful to a brewer to, to – if it tastes like vinegar, there's nothing you can do about it. Like, right. There, if there's a packaging issue, whatever. But if we we don't like a beer – and beer is very – it's very subjective too. Like you could – my opinion will change from your opinion, mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, but if both of us are like, oh, this beer really sucks, then we chug it. Well, someone said, why don't you do a chugging challenge? And YouTube was just coming out. So we're like, hey, there's this video platform. Let's see what we can do with it. So we had a contest, and we said, first, pick the beer that we should chug. And someone had to say, why don't you chug a Dogfish 120-minute IPA, which at the time was like t over 20%. And we're like, oh, my God, we're going to die. <laughs> it's still a 12-ounce bottle. We didn't know. And we looked on the Internet. Like, nobody had chugged a Dogfish. In fact, nobody was chugging beer on YouTube. So we're like, hey, let's do it. That sounds like a great well, I idea. Mean, I, it's not... <laughs> I don't. I can't foresee a bunch of people sitting around saying, "Hey, you know what would be cool?" But now it's, everyone's like, "Yeah, of course you, you should put down on YouTube." But then we're like, "Yeah, why not? Let Let's try this." So we had a contest and said, uh, "Pick the person who's going who has to chug this beer." So uh, at the end of the voting, it ended up that I was the person that that had to chug this beer, and uh, we embellished the entire thing. I mean, it was a six second chug, and we made it a seven minute video. I had a blood bag hooked up to my arm. We had a paramedic come in who was actually a real paramedic who was a fan of the show and said, I want to help you guys out. So we, we brought him in, and he's, he's a really good friend of ours now. Uh, he came in. We put a blood pack on my arm. We, like I said, we embellished the whole thing, chugged the beer, didn't think anything of it. Well, next thing we know, there are 17 pages of hate on ratebeer.com about how people want us dead, and beer snobs, I should say. Other guys thought it was funny, but the hardcore beer snobs are like, you disrespected that brewery. How yeah. could you do this? Oh, my God, you guys are jerks. You're knuckleheads. You're a disgrace to craft beer. And we're like, huh. all right, well, whatever. Didn't really think much of it. Didn't really care. Really, That's fine. Until it, it got a little rough where people were really getting vulgar with their, their replies to us. And social media was like just starting to take off, so we didn't really know how to react to it. Well, then we get a, a message from Draft Magazine. And said, we want to do a story about you guys. I'm like, what? <laughs> They're like, 
we want to do a story about you guys. We want to talk about the chug. I'm like, oh my god. I'm like, sick puppy. It's got a name, the chug, and everyone knew about it. So they did a, a quick story about. It. I have it. I still have copies of it at home, and it happens to be the same issue that Sam Calgione was featured on the front cover. So it was like perfect timing. Wow. So kismet. He's on the front. And then there's a story about two knuckleheads in Pittsburgh chugging his most sacred beer. And he, you talked to him about this too, right? I, I did. So first his wife uh, got a hold of us and said, just wanted to let you know, we, we saw the video and my stomach dropped. I'm like, I so respect this guy and everything he does. Like my favorite brewery. We just like really insulted him. And she said, this is the funniest thing we've ever seen. Please come out and visit us. <laughs> Sam wants to meet you. And un- unfortunately, we never got that chance to go out there. Uh, you know, things just came up. Life came up. Uh, I ended up starting a family, so that, that never happened. Well, two years ago, Sam came to Pittsburgh, and I-, I went up to him, and I introduced myself. He looked at me and went, you're the guy that chugged my beer. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> He's like, that was funny. He's, I loved watching that. He goes, we all loved watching that. And I got this great picture. Like He gave me a big hug and everything, and, and like everything was cool, so... Like that was the thing that that kicked it off for us. Like one random thing that a fan, uh, fan suggested, just took off, and then we went to we would go to beer fest, and people were like, "You're the guy who chugged the beer." I gotta ask you though, what was the real? I mean, I know you really dramatized the video, but what was it like after chugging that beer? Oh, I it, it really hit me. Hallucinations, and, and there's a reason why it really hit me hard. Is I chugged that beer on Good Friday. And being Catholic, I fasted, oh, you fasting? I oh, fasted shit. that day. So I chugged that beer with nothing else in my system. And yeah, it, I, the end of that video was, yeah, I, I felt like I was hallucinating. I'm like, oh my God, this is such a rush right now. This is the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> and I never chugged a, a 120, I think, again after that. Like it was just a one time thing. Sick Puppy then took up the reins and then chugged a beer. Every time we would go out to a bar, people would say, chug that 120, and they would buy us beers to chug. So that was like our shtick for like three or four years. It was great. And then I loved it. Then liver disease came along. Oh, and had yeah. to... So that was the long, drawn-out story, but that's how, that was like the big moment for us. And, and then we stayed in the, uh, the iTunes, like, I guess it's their, their What's Hot. We've, we haven't left it since 2007. I, I so there we took the show took a brief hiatus and it stayed up there. It stayed in the top twenty. I have no idea how the hell that happened. Wow! But it it was up there and I I contacted the website host or the, my podcast host at the time. I said, "Is this legit?" And they're like, "Yeah, you, you've got evergreen content." I'm like, "Wait, what?" He's like, "You have evergreen content," and I never thought about it that way. See, and that that was what I was going to ask that question, but you may have already answered it. With so many podcasts out there now. What do you have to do to really stand out and, and get to a point where people are going to find you six from, months from now, a year right. from now? Evergreen content could be the answer to that question because if you're doing a show about what's happening next weekend, well, after next weekend, there's really not a lot of reason to listen to that show. Right. The big thing is uh, how you title your episodes because you want to, ha- or even in the show description, you want to see what beers you have because that makes it searchable. A lot of the content that I have that keeps getting picked back up, uh, for instance, one of them is uh, our, our most downloaded show was somewhere in the 60s. Uh, it was when we interviewed Zane Lamprey. He came to town, and oh, I can't even tell you how long ago that show was. And he came to town, and his... And for those who don't know, who is that? Oh, he, So he's a comedian who had a show called Three Sheets. He's, basically, his, his job is getting drunk and talking about it. Kind that like sounds about movie. right. He's a comedian. And he had this show on, I think it was like Travel Network and a few others where he traveled around the, the world and would drink and show you the culture at in like England and Ireland, like the, the staple places. But then he would go to some really exotic locations and talk about drinking there. And he had a sidekick, Steve McKenna, that was basically like his whipping boy for drinking. But it, I mean, it, it had a fun element to it. So we were watching. We're like he's talking about craft beer. It was one of our ways to get craft beer into the mainstream when it wasn't. So his people reached out to us and said, uh, "Zane's coming to town, and he really wants to meet you guys." I'm like, "Whoa!" I'm like, "Puppy, Zane Lamprey's a fan of ours. This is this is pretty cool." So we had like a geek out moment, and sick puppy just wanted to chug beers with Steve, which he did. <laughs> and I, I think we almost killed the guy. <laughs> 
Uh, he didn't realize the professionals oh, that he was well, getting we showed, with. We showed up to Mr. Small's Theater, and there's a picture. There's a picture somewhere. I don't think we ever posted online of us handing Steve two growlers that we got from Blocktown of beer, and he's like, "You guys are gonna kill me." I'm like, "That's the plan." <laughs> right? We're drinking. He's like, and he just had this smile, and we went back in the room, started drinking beers. We met Zane. Awesome interview. Uh, really, really smart guy. He doesn't come across that way on his shows. Like you wouldn't think of him as like an intellectual, but when you talk to the guy, he's very intelligent with with just about every subject we came up with. Like he's very business savvy, and he's got like the you always have like the character, or like how you present yourself on TV and everything. But when you talk to him, he's a very smart guy. And yeah, we just we had a great time with that. We recorded the show there, and because we said you know Zine Lamprey, and everyone listened to it. He gave us a fantastic interview. Uh, we ended up filtering alcohol through our personal alcohol filter we took with us. So we had a bottle of uh, cheap whiskey. I think it was whiskey that we had. And we filtered it through the Gray Kangaroo, which back in the day was this device where you put a bottle on the top, empty bottle on the bottom, and then the charcoal filter, kind of like a Brita, would filter the impurities out of your alcohol. And he drank it and went, oh, my God, this is the best $5 you know, booze I ever had. So we sat there and we like drank a bottle of liquor before he went out on stage and, and did all that stuff. So uh, that's... One of the ways that we stand out, but also what I noticed today is that you have to be very social. Like it's no longer you just put out a show and you're kind of done. And I hate saying back in the day, but back in the day we would we'd post a show, we put on some beer forums, and and that was pretty much it. You didn't have anything else to do, and it mm-hmm. kind of just grew organically that way. Now you've got to be on Facebook and you have to be on Twitter and the soon to be dead Google Plus and. And Instagram, you have to make small, you know, small pieces of content to, to send out there because the attention spans like five to ten seconds. And I have to think there that might be why a lot of people get frustrated, yes. and you see a lot of episodes get started, and at the beginning everybody's gung ho, and all of a sudden the show just it just it's done, and it's because there's that marketing element behind it. I mean, and you look at how like with this podcast, I did more to launch the the Breaking Roos podcast and. This is, like I said earlier in the show, this is my fourth run at a podcast. Mm-hmm. I've done more to get this show off the ground than I ever did before with social media, running the promotion in the first week, doing the five episodes, and then everybody got a chance to win a prize if they went and dropped a review. Like These were things that were not anything that were in my right. mindset when I felt like it was one of those things that, well, people are going to listen to this because they like beer and... They know my platform, but that's not the case. You really have to drive it home so people don't lose focus and lose attention. Yeah. What's tough, too, is it, it's a very much a pay-to-play platform now, or world, I guess, if you want to promote yourself. When Facebook was coming out and Twi- you know, Twitter was out there, it was easy for us to get a hold of people because there was n- they weren't throttling down your reach. Mm-hmm. Now you have to have a page and a group on Facebook, and then if you want that to actually get out for people to see it, then you've got to pay to do it. And I have, I, I'm a digital marketer, so I, I know the cost behind that. And it is not cheap for anybody. It's, they'll tell you it's cheap. It's not. And especially if you go hyper-local with, you know, just want to focus on Pittsburgh, it's still not cheap. Because like, mm-hmm. you have to see which ads are going to work for you. And once you do that, then you, you A-B test everything. So you're still spending like hundreds of dollars to find the perfect ad that may or may not still get someone to download your show right. or register for it. And also, this is... Um, this is something that I did get out of podcasting is I, I have a career because of it. I taught myself marketing. I'm an IT guy by trade. I was a web guy and audio video guy. And I had to teach myself marketing because I wanted people to, to listen to my show. So I'm like, mm-hmm. all right, what do you guys want to hear? And it's, that worked for me because nobody was saying, what do you guys want to hear? It was always, I'm going to tell you what you're going to listen to. And, and that's it. And that's how, some of the older podcasts were and, and still are that uh, to this day that are still running around that talk about craft beer. They tell you what, you know, what they want you to know, not, okay, you tell me what you want to hear. What, what do you want me to review? And I'll do it for you. Mm-hmm. Cause I know what I like. I don't, I don't want to listen to myself talk. Although that's kind of why a podcast is so I can listen to myself talk. But, <laughs> uh, but what, do you, what do you guys want? And I'll find it for you and I'll, we'll talk about it and let's see what's going on. It, beer has always been about community and, having a good time and celebrating and relaxing and whatever. Uh, it's not supposed to be this smug, you know, egotistical experience where you're, you think you're better than somebody else. Right. And I could like just rant about this for a long time, but I won't, but, uh, 
We've got the airtime. We can always do another episode about that. Because that's true. No, that's we, a we, we've got the time. You've got the beer. <laughs> With corn syrup. That's... <laughs> that is a still a, a pretty predominant element that I still see. Uh, I, I mean, cyberbullying is a major thing, but it, it, yeah. it's pretty big. I mean, it's not as probably as rampant in as other areas of the world, but people are still tearing other people apart because they like a certain beer. I forget who coined the phrase. It was one of my friends, but they could start calling them beer holes. So basically they're beer assholes. They're yeah. beer holes. Th- that scene's always been around. That that has been around. No matter what you get into, there's always that group that's the elitist. And, and, I, I, and ironically, when you talk to the brewers, they wonder why. And it, it, I've had this conversation with wine people, too. Like, the creators of wine don't want people to think of their product that way, pretentious and unapproachable. They want you to have fun with it and enjoy it. Because that's the way that those guys are. Yeah. And they're but, they're artists. I mean, they, they create things, and... And they, they do it because they love it. And when someone tries to be snobbish about it, you're kind of you're kind of taken away from what they you know from their their creation. Like it's not meant to be that way, and it's well, you quit taking it that way. But you look at sports; it's like that, arts. And I, I think it's because the people that are like that need something to latch onto. Like that's their thing mm-hmm. that they need to be the expert on. Do that in a in a you approachable can, way. It, I, it's it's hard. Yeah. I, it's, that's so hard to listen to. It is, but the people that listen to it are usually that way themselves. Yeah. If you're a very point. Type A, you're going to listen to very Type A people. Yeah. It's a lot of the the older shows too, like what, that was what put us off on a lot of the early craft beer shows. It was that they were like saying, "Well, this is what you like, and if you don't like it, you suck, and your taste is wrong." Well, no, my palate is different. Genetically, my palate is different than your palate. Right. I taste certain things that you don't taste. You know, when I, when I eat cilantro, I like cilantro. Some people taste soap. It, it, there's just, there's a lot that's, that goes on with, with the snobbery that honestly took, drew me away from craft beer for a while because it got really bad in Pittsburgh. Like you, you couldn't post anywhere without someone just biting your head off and be like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, there's nothing wrong with me. You're not, first of all, uh, you're not a master Cicerone, so bite me. Uh, <laughs> you're not a brewer, so bite me. You're just another guy like me. Mm. So why should I listen to you? I enjoy the beer. It's my money. I'm drinking it. I I look back to when I first came up with the idea for Breaking Brews, and, and the website was designed to talk about beer in that approachable fashion because I remember it was a lot different social media-wise back in 2013 when the idea really came out. I mean, there were groups and there was conversation happening, but it definitely wasn't to the level that we we're experiencing today. Mm-hmm. But I also I went on to Beer Advocate, and I read my dad a couple of reviews that people had written. And I said, I, I just want you to give me the honest feedback when I read this to you. So I read all of the, you know, the, the, the big fancy $10 words that were included in these reviews. And my dad's like, that's not... I said, I agree with you 100%. That was what I didn't want to do. There was no reason to create another website that did that. So it really launched her, and there was still, to this day, the need to educate some folks that don't understand what's happening in this world, but to do it in a way where you don't feel, well, shit, I don't want to have to act like that or look down my nose at people, and that should never be the way that it is. You should never be ashamed for ordering a beer. Fuck no. Yeah, maybe Bud Light, but... Uh, I'll even let that slide, depending where it depends where you're at. You do what you like, <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, I'm not going to put you down for what you order because you know what? If you have some kind of emotional tie to that beer, then you know what, dude, drink it up. Yeah, I, I don't do it. That's the thing. I don't. I haven't drank that beer in years, and that's. But that's me. If if that's what you enjoy, then that's what you enjoy. But it's the same people that do that. But then they'll why can you why do you drink that craft beer shit? That's ridiculous. You know, it's it, there's the reverse snobbery. So where <laughs> what I've seen from so I, I took a few years off from podcasting and with 531 days to be exact, not that I counted. But <laughs> um, while I did that, I I spent a lot of time uh, watching how people interact with beer and how they talked about beer because I was just really curious because I'm like I, I've professed you know my love for craft beer for all these years. I go I'm just 
I, I'm really curious about like even the, the psychology behind why people are drinking what they're drinking. And I noticed that when people who drink macro beers, your Bud Coors Miller, and that's all, they would get ticked off when you would drink a craft beer. Even if you didn't say my beer is better than yours, like you're just drinking it. The reason why they would get so hellbent is because they felt like you were trying to be like, because they don't like it that you're trying to be better than them. So they see that as like a superiority thing. I had people that would, you know, get upset because of the fact that I like craft beer and I wouldn't drink a Miller. It depends where I was at. Like if I'm at, if I'm out golfing, I'm going to drink Miller Lite. I don't, I really don't care. It's refreshing to me. And I, I'm not, I don't want to sit there and think about the beer. I just want something to drink and yeah, I have a beer. That's fine. I'm being sociable with my friends, but the people that are hardcore on it also aren't used to people coming up and, and saying that they're wrong. So like they're, they're taking it as that that's a shot at their lifestyle, something that they grew up with. It's kind of like you always have that one parent or that one, that one uncle who was like, you don't disobey with me. You don't disobey me because I'm your elder and I am right. And if you object to me, you're wrong and there's something wrong with you. There's not is that, and they shouldn't. It's just they don't realize that you know people have different tastes mm -hmm. and they think that there's something wrong with them because they don't taste what you're, you're tasting. Yeah. The big thing with our show from day one was, should I drink that is about beer drinking for the average Joe or Jill, I guess, for a beer drink for everybody. We wanted everyone to be able to get in the craft beer or at least try it. Just tell us that you tried it. That's fine. Be open-minded to try something else. That's all we're asking. And I'm not going to put you down if you don't, because some people, they just don't want to do it. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to give me crap about it, I don't have time for you. I, I, Whatever. Bye. See ya. <laughs> that, that's just the way it is. There's enough people out there to interact with that do want to try yeah. something new, that have that open mind. That, and if yeah, you want to learn more about it, I am more than happy to tell you about it, but I'm not going to say, here's why this beer is better than your cores or your bud. No, because I don't know you. I don't know why. You know, your dad might have given you a Coors Light. That might have been your drink growing up. Like That would have been your first beer with him, or in my case, a golden anniversary. And that I might have swiped from their basement, but still, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm like that's that's our big thing is that uh, we were tired of all these shows putting people down, and we're like there needs to be something for the average Joe, and that's why we we took off too, is because we talked to everybody, we didn't put people down, and there were craft beer people locally too that would come up to us and be like, "You guys are full of shit, like you're wrong about this beer, you're wrong about the brewing process." We're like, "Well, no, we're not. That's pretty scientific and." pretty black and white how the beer was made. But they're just like, no, you're wrong about how you're tasting and how you should how you should drink this beer. And you're not you're not getting enough of a you're not breathing through your nose and through your mouth enough. I'm like, dude, it's a freaking beer. All right. <laughs> Look at what you're drinking. Yeah. If I'm buying I'm gonna savor that thing. But if I'm just buying like a five dollar beer or whatever, like let me enjoy my beer the way I want to enjoy it. Yeah. Now I'll drink it without the first time I usually drink a beer because of how I am I'll focus on the aroma and everything. But if I'm going to go into a store, buy a beer, and sit down and like have a hot dog or something, I'm not going to sit there and analyze the damn thing. Right. Give me a plastic cup. Give me my beer. Give me my hot dog. Leave me alone. Mm -hmm. I have so much anger towards beer snobs. So ah, do you have any podcast hosts that, I mean, and this could go back to even when you started, that, that inspired you to do it? Or are there any podcast hosts that you listen to now that you really dig? The show that really got us going, uh, there was one called The Real Happy Hour, which I've made a lot of really close friends through. And they kind of showed us the way of, of podcasting. We found out about them actually through Tiki Bar TV, which way back in the day, they were, they were considered one of the first big podcasts to come out. I had watched them. Uh, so this is the weird like trail through it. So I watched G4 tech TV who did a story about Tiki bar TV, Tiki bar TV, then did a, a podcast with the real happy hour. And I found out about the real happy hour. And then I said, you know what, let's, let's do something. So, um, meeting those guys was, was incredible. They were uh, former musicians. Well, actually they still are musicians, but they were big in the eighties to audio recording with, uh, with their podcast. So we asked them a bunch of questions and they were, invaluable resources for us. They taught us about, you know, how to get right microphones to get, what kind of headphones to use, like how to, 
how to come up with show ideas, how to like come up with show notes and a flow. Because they, there was three people on the show, but they had like eight characters because they would change their voices and they would use audio tools to manipulate their voices to have multiple. They would have one guy having a conversation with three people, but it's only him talking because he would plan out in his mind, here's how the script is going to go and record. It's amazing to, to watch them work. So um, Kirk John, uh, Randall Throckmorton Bacon. Uh, yeah, those guys, those guys were definitely big for us. And then, uh, today it's, I listen to a whole bunch of different type of podcasts. I'm big into barbecue. So I, I listen to a lot of cooking shows now. Uh, there's no one that I go to is like, this is my inspiration. I, I like Mark Maron's style. Uh, I try not to swear as much as he does cause he just kind of goes off the hinge. But I, I love the fact that it was just him in a garage, like just sitting down with somebody to talk. That's, that's the big thing. Just have a good conversation. Mm-hmm. And he does a pretty good job with that. He leaves in a lot of his ums and buts and, and pauses, which is great. Cause I like hearing that raw conversation. I know it's engineered, you know, to a, an extent. Uh, I try to listen to some NPR, but after a while, it's, it's just the same stuff over and over again. So there's no one I think today that really, really stands out as an inspiration. I li- all the podcasts I listen to, which I think last count I had 50 I subscribe to. I don't listen to all of them. I usually really? Get... See, I, I, had to un- I had a bunch I unsubscribed from because I ate up so much memory on my phone when I'd get a new episode. I just, I keep a Ooh. mental note and then I go and find it and download a single episode. But Well, that, that's the difference with, and this is a great example too of how people consume podcasts. So I don't listen to anything on my phone. Okay. I listen to everything on my Mac. Okay. So it's, I have iTunes and it's just, I'll go through and I'll look at it and it's honestly probably been three weeks since I've looked at iTunes because I, I haven't had a lot of time to, to listen to it. So I'll go back and I'll go through and I'll look at what all the, the subjects are. So I'll, I'll see like this episode is with so-and-so or interviewing this, this guest. And if I want to listen to it, I'll save it. If not, I just remove it. Yeah. See, I'm, I'm in the car a lot, so I'm constantly listening to podcasts in the car and I'll download what episodes I want to listen to right to my phone. And now if I was traveling, yeah, if I was on the go, I would absolutely do that. But I, I used to sit at my desk a lot and, uh, that's my time to listen to podcasts. But once I get done with that, I, I try not to listen a big thing, though, is, and this is why uh, podcasting is taking off, too, is as much shit as millennials get, they're the ones we have to thank for this boom. If you look, if you look at a lot, most of the millennials, they've got earbuds in. They're listening to podcasts now, too, which is great. And it's I think that, was, that definitely got it going. But every kid today, even millennials and Gen Z and whatever other bullshit name, they're, they're coming up from the next generations. Every person has earbuds in. They're listening to something, and now they're starting to listen to podcasts. So 10 years ago when we were doing it, and people were like, this is stupid. No one's ever going to – who's going to download an audio show? You just turn the radio on. Well, guess what? Yeah. They're here. They're we, doing it now. There were so many things with technology that we, we take for granted that we have at our disposal every day. I remember back in, in college a professor saying how all our books would be on this little tiny platform or this little tiny pad that you could just – Oh, yeah. like a, I mean, it was he was talking about a Kindle, which of course mm-hmm. then became I, you know transferable to iPads and Samsungs and whatnot. But yeah, everyone was like, "You're out of your mind, dude. That's not that sounds so crazy." Because you know you're walking around with a book bag with four textbooks in it. That could this this is life. Well, yeah. Oh, well, there was a time mind open, folks. When we started podcasting, we knew everyone was listening on desktop because I mean, nobody we had mobile phones, but we had Blackberries. Yeah, nothing that was going to access yeah. a podcast. Right? So we never thought of that, but MP3 players were starting to get big. Mm-hmm. I think like, the Zune might have been out at the time. But like, I even had a cheap Insignia one from Best Buy that I would just I would load up. And I'm like, something's going to happen with this. And people kept saying, no, no. Who wants to carry their music like that? Like, we have the Walkmans, but nobody's going to do that. And all those people now are the same ones that are asking me what kind of MP3 bu- players they should buy. Yeah. How do they load iTunes? <laughs> It, it just it's funny how that comes around that we, we saw this stuff years ago. I, I want to say the first I, I, iPod that I bought, which was probably oh. five, I'm trying to, it was after a good night at the casino, like the next day, <laughs> iPod. And I, I'm pretty sure it had in the menu podcasts. And this is before I had even met you. So, mm-hmm. pod, and like I said, you were the, when you were dive bar back at like that first, that was the first inaugural craft beer yep. week deal. 
and that was when we met and talked and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So even I mean, think before then, I don't think I had anything re- regarding a podcast on my radar. So that thing sat there all those years, and I never gave it a second thought of like, what the fuck's a podcast? I had friends that were big into tech, and they still didn't they didn't really know what podcast was, you know, or what yeah, what it was back then, and what it was going to become. I said, Guys, this is a platform for us to bring what we do. Mm-hmm. You could say all of George Carlin's, you know, deadly words, and and nothing will happen to you, as long as you put an explicit tag on your. You know, someone could listen to the show and say, "Hey, did you hear what he said on there?" But how's that any different from any other platform that's right. out there? That that's the big thing. And right now, I'm in your ears. <laughs> I'm in your head. <laughs> if you saw the look on his face, oh. wow. <laughs> Thank God this is just radio. That's some freaky shit. <laughs> well, that's the cool thing, too. So it gives a chance for a lot of people who have always wanted to get into radio, like me, and yeah, for to sure. have a way to d- actually do it, to get into radio. I just I I fell in love with, with radio and with being a DJ and all that stuff in high school, and my family was like, hell no, you're never going to make any money. You're not going to make a living doing that. Don't even think about it. I tried going to school for it, and they're like, no. You're not going to school for that. Find something else. I got into computers, and they're like, you'll never make any money at computers. <laughs> Guess how that worked out. Uh, <laughs> still not making money, but I'm working <laughs> in computers. But it's it's great because it gives everyone that chance to to live out that dream of if you always just wanted a show, thing, you can release a show. And, I mean, you don't have to make it public. You don't have to have a ton of listeners. If As long as you even have five fans, that's five people that are listening to your opinion. We've... No, no other time in the history of mankind have we had this kind of communication availability to like this opportunity to come out and say, "This is my opinion," and people are going to listen to you. It I sounds w- almost Gary V ish. It does, but no, you're yeah. ab- you're absolutely right. Back in the day when I went to I went to college for communications and, and writing, and it had the, the communications had a very heavy emphasis on radio and television and. Very old school when I think back to the platforms we were using to edit video and whatnot. And I had a radio show my freshman and sophomore year on the, nice. cam- the campus radio station <laughs> that didn't go further than maybe two miles off campus. But it got as far as my mom's office at Zippo. This is back in Bradford. And every Friday, they'd play my show at Zippo. When I got out of college, the first place I went, I, looked, I was looking in Pittsburgh, and I interviewed with the Gazette. And it was basically for an unpaid internship where I'd be working a shit ton of hours for no money. And I'm like, how how am I going to pull that off? That's just not going to work. And then I bounced around. But then I started thinking about all the things that I did that lead up to what I do now. Everything I'm doing now speaks exactly to what I went to college for. <laughs> I started a blog and, 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 and got on the map with writing. And then now I'm doing a podcast and, and doing video. And all these things were... I had the little nuggets planted back in college, and a lot of people say like they went to college and they do nothing with what they do, or they do nothing now with what they learned in college. My degree is in it's interactive crazy. media design, and I do absolutely nothing with that. And that, well, that was from the the soon to be closed Art Institute. Yeah, <laughs> we're noticing a trend here. Things that <laughs> that are no soon to be no longer there. Talk to Seaback about making that special. Things that are soon to be no longer here. Uh, uh, yeah, I'd love to watch the episode on the <laughs> Art Institute. The Strip District is one of the most historic areas in the great city of Pittsburgh, and no visit to this always hopping area of town is complete without a stop at the Beer Hive. Located in the heart of the Strip on Penn Avenue, the Beer Hive features a constantly rotating craft beer draft, bottle, and can selection for you to enjoy each and every day, plus daily happy hours, special events, and much, much more. The Hive has also recently rolled out a new food menu, too, so make sure you come hungry and enjoy all the good eats they have in store for you. Plus, grab your home stock of pickles, courtesy of Pittsburgh Pickle Company, as well as a jug of Briny Mary, a Bloody Mary mix infused with Pittsburgh Pickle Company brine. Perfect for those morning cocktails when you don't want to leave the house. To learn more, visit www.thebeerhive.com today and check them out on Instagram at thebeerhivepgh. So when I went to Pitt, it was originally for um, communications, and then my family threw a fit. So then I, I got into psychology, which I was starting to like that. Then my, I think my second semester of my freshman year, I had this teacher who was a chain smoking lady, 
with a chronic cough that was just miserable. It was like something out of a movie. Every time she's talking, like, <laughs> I just blew out your speakers. But <laughs> you were and, far enough and, away when you did that. And I'm like theology. And I'm like, this sucks. I don't know what the hell I want to do. Computer science, man, I can do. <laughs> and this is 95 or 94, 95. And uh, you found out about AOL, and I'm like, oh, okay, this is this is kind of neat. Ooh, I'm chatting with people I don't know. This is really cool. And Pitt finally gave students web pages. So I, I taught myself HTML, how to make Mozilla, and which then, you know, Netscape and eventually Internet Explorer. But I'm like, there's, I was like, I like creating things and I like doing this. I'm like, there's got to be something to do with it. So eventually got a job in computers. And then, I mean, that led to me meeting up with Sick Puppy. And I'm like, hey, I, I like audio video stuff. You're a tech guy. Let's figure something out. And then it just, you're right. It just it gradually, you know, it all kind of played together. Like if I wouldn't be able to do this now if I didn't have, you know, A, B, and C didn't happen. Right. I'll never forget, this was probably, I think, 2009, like right when we were hitting our, really starting to take off. Uh, We were teaching beer school downtown. We could go to any beer fest, and it was, and this was great. It was like royalty feeling going in, because everyone knew who we were. People would buy us drinks, and like, can we be on the show? I'm like, yeah, come on, let's just talk about beer. Everything was going great. And a family member came up to me, and she's like, so this this podcast is just a fad. I'm like, what? She goes, it's just a fad. I don't know why you're wasting your time on it. You should like read a book or something. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, that was my reaction. I'm like, okay. Even, even if it wasn't for a family member to yeah, just get the shit on everything you're doing. And it's God, also the same dear. family members that, w- that were also telling me you never make money on computers, don't get in a radio. Like, craft beer will never be a I, thing. I'm, I'm noticing yeah. this trend. And they said that to me, and I'm just like, no, you know what? I'm I'm gonna do something with this, and you almost get that I'm gonna prove you wrong yeah. mentality when something and I'm like, like you that know happens. What? I am tired of hearing this. So, and that's when we really kicked in the high gear, and and the show blew up like just it, it it took off with the the chug and everything. But it like we were number two at one point in food and drink on iTunes. That's huge. Like we we took off, and now I'm. I'm not going to say who the family member is, but that family member now comes to me for <laughs> why their iTunes doesn't sync and can I help their friends out starting one? So. I, well, that <laughs> seems to be, you had mentioned Gary V earlier. And yes. I know that he he's talked about this because how people, when they when they don't know a platform, they're immediately scared of it. And, yes. and he's the type of guy, like he said it millions of times, that when he learned all this stuff, he wasn't tw- in his 20s. I mean, this stuff no. started to. Take no, I was off in my thirties when we started. Exactly, like you, as long as the platform's there, age is irrelevant. You yeah. can you can learn it if you're willing to accept that this is going to be viable. He started Wine Library TV. Oh, so for those of you who don't know Gary V, it's Ga- Gary Vaynerchuk. Vaynerchuk. Look him up, Gary V. Inspirational as so, all hell. Like this he, guy's got some good good content so out there was, every day. He's yeah, he was starting right around the time we started doing. Should I drink that? And. I remember watching his early stuff. And in fact, his early videos are what got us saying we should probably do more with video. And looking back, probably should have reached out to the guy. But, you know, didn't do that because we were beer. And there's a fine line between beer and wine people, too. And probably if we would have reached out to him, we could have done something. Now, beer and wine people are, are totally cool with each other. But then there was like, you are wine or you are beer. You cannot be both. <laughs> Which still, you know, yeah. it, That's there's still people like that. But. but yeah, but then the flip side of that, you look at beer and wine and yeah. food at sometimes too. So they're covering all the gamuts of what they cover on their website. There is there is so much that we can do now with finally bringing beer, wine, and food together. Before it was always one or the other. Well, you could do like wine and beer, or sorry, wine and food and beer and food. But it's finally even socially acceptable that we can pair everything together now. And this is such a, that's why I keep saying it's such a great time to be alive because there's so many restaurants even opening in Pittsburgh, whereas before it was, no, you only go eat at this restaurant if you want Italian. That's it. Anyone else, they suck, you eat here. And usually you go in and be like, well, this sucks. <laughs> My mom makes better pasta or whatever. Mm-hmm. But now there's so many options for food. Like, And I'm saying this living in like the Pittsburgh, it's very much like if it's not Pittsburgh or not Pittsburgh bread, you eat what Yinzers eat. Mm-hmm. But now it's, you know, sushi restaurants start coming up, you know, late 90s, 2000s. And then more and more of those different types of restaurants where they were pushing the envelope. You're paying $10 for a hamburger, which, 
you talk to the old school Yinzers who are most likely drinking an icy light, I'm not going to spend more than $2 on a hamburger because that's the way it's always been. Right. We're at a time now where you can pretty much do anything the hell you want and someone's going to say, I'll try that. You never had that before. It's a, it, well, especially when you see a higher price tag, and this is something. Oh uh, yeah, price tags are. I'm great. sure. Well, <laughs> no, I'm sure I'll, I'll be covering this at some point here on the Breaking Brews podcast. The my hometown of Bradford's getting two breweries. And really? Yeah, all, and almost not simultaneously, but they're in planning as we speak today. And this is a town that has you know dollar twenty five beer specials. At least back when I lived there, that was mm-hmm. you know it was not a you go somewhere and you get a draft for a buck. And I, I mean, now it's a, it's a little bit more price, but there's a couple bars that have realized that people do like this beer. And I've had this conversation with my dad about what a consumer will will drink and what they'll pay for a good beer. And he's of the belief that it's going to be more difficult in a, a small town like that. But at this, I, and I don't disagree completely. However, you look at how how uh, craft breweries have come into small communities. Mm-hmm. And they've really transformed the game. Their quality, so you're paying a little more, but now we're going to get you ensconced in a high quality product. And they'll then buy, people to buy it. They'll start buying those beers if it's made locally because it's some. It's one of them mm-hmm. making it. I noticed this up in Dubois for a while. It was a craft beer dead zone. Like we would go up to visit family, and we would have to bring our own beer just because there there wasn't anything up there. There is a fantastic store. It's one of my favorite stores to go to. Uh, props to those guys up there. They bring in beers from... And this is great with their location because they could go out to State College to bring in beers that we can't get in Pittsburgh. And mm-hmm. then they also bring Pittsburgh beers up. But they get some incredible beers. And they're, they they have a sustainable business up there. Along with that... Damn, another thing that's closed. So Doc G's was a brewery up there. But there were people, especially in... Uh, my in-law side who were just, we are not going to, we don't drink craft beer. We're, we won't try it. We drink our bud. We drink our cores. That's it. Doc G's open. They said, we'll try it. It's a local guy. And I'm like, that was the gateway. Yeah. Now since then, and unfortunately due to mismanagement, Doc G's is closed. So I've heard mismanagement, but I was up there and it had closed, but enough people had tried their beers that now they're they're going over super sub and they're they're picking up beers there or they're going to Indiana and they're you know they're like yeah I was they go to Indiana for business they're like well yeah we tried that levity place they love I will say Noble Stein mm-hmm. because <laughs> I took up some hop higher hands yeah no oh, you turned oh yeah right blew all their minds I went up there with a growler one time and I'm like guys just try this it's a small brewery in Indiana and they drank it. And they're like, this goes down too easy. And they were all just shit faced. Yeah, no, that's, and I can attest. I'm like, this is what I drank. Well, <laughs> and this was that, that beer, when, when Doug and I first discovered that beer, it was the night we met the Noblestein guys. It was at a beer so fest good. that we were judging, Fat Beers of the Berg. That night when we met them, I didn't ask about the ABV on that beer. So no. now we're at Beers of the Berg, and they have it, and I'm just drinking it, and I'm all, I'm wrecked. I'm like, guys, what is the ABV on that beer? It's like, Oh, like 8.8 8 or something like are you fucking serious and we're just throwing them back yeah, yeah. i'm just tossing it back I'm, I'm thinking you know it's a saison abv and i know that was before they were open and when they started brewing on their commercial system they did bring the abv down so now oh, it's okay. in the six range but back then when they were just brewing on their pilot system in the garage that was a big beer but that was a tasty beer and it still is a tasty beer it's just not as potent as it was it was like golden monkey for me like if you want to forget about life for a while yeah. that's what you drank and when i gave that to my relatives they're just like whoa like this was made around here i'm like indiana yeah. go you guys have business out there so now when they travel around they ask me what breweries are in their area because they do a lot in central pa i'm like guys there's so many small breweries that are opening up this oh, is perfect yeah for you. and that's what i love about the movement now is you don't need to have a huge brewery to make an impact. Like, mm-hmm. you know, granted, what happened with Hitchhiker is is not normal. Andy's talent is insane, but the fact that he opened a small brew pub in well, he was the brewer at a small brew pub in Mount Lebanon, a place that fits like what fifty people, or well, depends on which neighbor you speak with. Mm-hmm. It's not a very big place, but their beers were consistently awesome, and now that led to them, you know, going opening up in Sharpsburg. But we need more of these smaller ones because there are these niche groups that want to stay. Like, I want to go down the street and have a beer, but I don't want to drink like 
Bud, Coors Miller. I don't want a drink of Blue Moon or a Sam Adams. I want something made local. It's a lot of pride in buying local, especially if it's Mount Lebanon or Dormont or Bethel or North Hills or whatever. Mm -hmm. They want to say, this is our beer and this is, I'm going to put my, you know, my flag in the ground. This is our beer and this is what we're going to go with. And with 92 neighborhoods in the Pittsburgh area, (laughs) Well, that's We're catching what, up to it. And I mean, this is more not just a Pittsburgh thing. It's a nationwide occurrence or yeah. a phenomenon because you see the decline in sales for flagship beers for big brands that like Sierra Nevada Pale Ale is a prime example. That's one of my favorite beers. And no matter what comes along, it's always going to be one that I can go back to and know I'm going to enjoy. I always want to yeah. have it in the fridge. But now we're focused on trying new and, and collecting badges. And at the same time, focusing on the hyper-local beer. And brew pubs and, and breweries with ta- uh, tap rooms are coming along and taking over that that role of neighborhood pub. That's where people are going to go to. They're going to support that brand because it's, like you just said, it's mm-hmm. in their neighborhood. And there are some breweries that are built on that model alone. They hardly distribute anything outside of their four walls. And your margins inside those four walls are way higher than pushing well, plus- it out. The other thing too is you you could talk to these the people that, most of the times the people that are working behind the counter either brewed the beer or were involved somewhere in the brewing process yeah. or know everything that's in that beer. You're not getting the marketing bullshit that was out there for years. When you're t- going to these breweries, and this is why I love going to like specifically like Hitchhiker and going out to Spoonwood and the other ones in the South Hills, is that I could talk to them and ask them a question, and they're not going to give me attitude. They're gonna say, yeah, here's what here's what this here's what I would pair with this beer. Here's here's what you're tasting in this. I can ask them questions. Whereas if I just go to any bar, and most times they won't. And granted, there are exceptions to the rule. Like you go to Pipers, yeah, you're gonna get an education at Pipers. But if you go and Fatheads too is a great place. But if you go to some of these neighborhood bars, you're not gonna get that. You're gonna get oh no, that well now you're gonna get that was made with corn syrup. Thanks, bud. <laughs> No, you're right. It's it's some places are putting that attention to detail with their with their servers to at least know a little bit about yeah. you know. And some of them are even going as far as giving them the first level of the Cicerone certification, just so they have that base knowledge to where they can understand a style and and, mm-hmm. and sound somewhat coherent about it when people ask them questions. But yeah, when you go to the source, it, it it's really that's pretty powerful. It, the people want they. They want to know what's in their food now. That's the like we, for years, for decades, we yeah here you know you want to eat eat this cereal because you know oh it's got whole grain but we're not going to tell you that it's got five cups of sugar in every spoonful that you eat or <laughs> or whatever. It's, you were always taught never to question what you're eating, what you're drinking. Just if the ad says, and that's I think that's the mentality from like the fifties, sixties, and seventies. And it's like when my parents were growing up, and my brother was growing up, and my cousins was that authority. You don't question what's on the label. If they say this is good, you eat it because it is. And now we're like, no, 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 no. Yeah. I want to know more about it. And I, I, the other part of it too is if I really like something now, and I've noticed this with other people is. We're going to try to duplicate that at home because I, now I want to see if I can do that. And I, I that's a lot with cooking with me is if I have a dish somewhere, I'm like, I don't know if I can make that at home. Beer is not so easy because not so easy you, you really got to invest with, with the brewing equipment. But like when it comes to food even or pairing up foods, I'm like, okay, I get this profile from this food now. How What beer out there that I've tasted before? It's, it gets you thinking. You're always learning. And that's why I love about the craft beer. many different groups that are getting involved with it. You can now ask these questions like, or what beer goes with the, You can pair beer with anything now. Yeah, no doubt. 10, 15 years ago, people would laugh at you if you said, what do I pair this beer with? Right, yeah. Really? It's just, you want to pair a beer with something? You have that for like an appetizer for your dinner or something. like. Mm-hmm. Oh, you want a beer with your dinner? Drink a Guinness. And that was like, that was it. Or we've got a chocolate stout from Lancaster or something. Drink that. Yeah. It's it's crazy because now there's just there's just so much on all those ends and again and with the restaurants elevating their cuisine they're also elevating their their tap rotation because there's nothing more frustrating than going to a place where you're going to have a thirty dollar steak and they've got Coors Light on tap. Ugh, it's just it's that it's drives horrible, me insane. Right? I hate that so much. You know, I I hope you Ugh. guys are enjoying this episode of the Breaking Brews podcast about the podcasting evolution. 
it's, it's safe to say we've gone off the rails a little bit, but let me tie it back to podcasting. Well, th- this is the yeah. evolution of, of not just of podcasting, but also with beer. Well, no, I really think yeah. we've covered some good ground with all of this, but let me ask you this. Do you okay. think that a lot of this can be attributed to podcasts and technology yes. overall? I, I think this could be attributed to all the information that we're... It's because we're able to get information out without any regulations behind it. Meaning, I could talk about whatever I want and whatever beers I want to pair with whatever food, and there's not going to be someone in between saying, well, you know, uh, Ruth Chris is a sponsor of ours, so you should tell them that you should really go to Ruth Chris. Like, you're going to get my opinion about it. You're going to get you're going to hear opinions about places that you most likely never knew existed. Instead of having some kind no matter what you do, there's always a corporate marketing or a corporate deal behind it with a lot of the big name reviews. And that's what always bugged me is you'll find out there's some backdoor deal or there is some agreement that Sam Adams does this, but Sam Adams does push out like a lot of recipes and stuff through their mailing list. So they, Sam Adams could say, oh, well, you know, this goes great if you buy, you know, steak from, buy steak from Woolies, you know, because it pairs best with, with what they produce. Well, mm-hmm. all right, yeah, obviously there's some kind of deal there now. And it's starting to come out with the internet too that you have to say there's a partnership. Mm-hmm. If you're, especially in like Instagram, if there's some kind of money exchanging hands or whatever. I think we can thank Firefest for that. <laughs> That's a whole nother depending, podcast. Well, depending on when you're picking up this podcast, yeah. that may be topical or it may not be. But if you ha- if it's still live on Hulu and Netflix, yeah. go watch the, the debacle that was Fire Festival. Oh, absolutely, it, it's and fantastic. yeah, that, and I th- yeah, that, that, I think that has a lot to do with what you just said. Like there's a there was a lot of ridiculousness out there with the influencers of the world, and yes. no one knew they were getting paid. That was my long way around of getting eventually to Firefest. But yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely check that out. But it's that's the great thing with I think with podcasts, and it, it started with bloggers. And it's, I, I wrote for a while. Uh, in fact, should I drink that uh, became a writing gig for a couple of years for both of us uh, back in the early days. So we would we would start blogging about it, but. We never had to say if there was if like this beer was provided by this brewery mm-hmm. or whatever, and there was also an understanding or this assumption I should say from brewers and through restaurants that they assume that if you're going to come in and review them, like if they're asking you to come in, you're going to write a fluff piece, and that's something that we said we would never do. And I've told brewers up front, I'm like, if I think your beer sucks, I'm going to tell you it sucks. I might be a little, I might watch how I word it, and, be, and I'm not going to say this is the worst freaking beer I've ever drank, but I'm going to say, here's why I don't like it. And that's something we had to teach ourselves. And I think a lot of people need to teach themselves is if you're going to criticize a beer, why exactly does, doesn't that work for you? Not just it sucks. There's a reason why it sucks. Not only, you know, you get educated on a beer, but you also get educated more about why something sucks. And that, that's an, I don't like this beer because it tastes like this to me. It tastes like well, why does it taste like piss? Well, go into more detail. What is that taste in your mouth? Like, is it make you really have to start thinking about adjectives to explain, you know, why this this thing sucks? Mm-hmm. And that helped us out and helped us teach other people that now piss. You never drank piss. What does that really remind you of? Think about that. People start to learn, and once you do that, then you're more you you help out the brewers too by saying here's what I'm tasting in this. And they could say, oh, well, maybe I added too much this ingredient, too much of that ingredient, or, okay, I understand where you're coming from with that. Whereas we had brewers that we reviewed their beers and we're just like, we didn't like it. Well, you don't know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you need to be able to listen to feedback. Amen. We also have to be able to give the feedback in a way that they can digest it and make it better. Yeah. Quit saying things just suck yeah, because meh. it's owned by somebody. It's meh. Oh, the untapped reviews of mm. this beer's meh. You're old meh. Yeah, no, I I think that's changed in a lot of degrees too, in a lot of ways too. Brewers are very receptive to the feedback, negative or positive, quality product out there. And I've told Andy when his when I did your pumpkin beer tastes like burning. Like I am getting a lot it's too heavy on the on the alcohol burn. He's like, oh, okay. He's like, well, no one told me that. I'm like, well, that's, and yeah, there you go. If you're not getting that feedback, everybody's th- telling you it's the greatest thing on the planet. It's hard to improve. And that's to think they should open breweries. 
is that nobody tells them anything honest. They their friends say you should open a brewery, and they're like, yeah, I'll go open a brewery, but they have no business yeah. experience. They've they've brewed a couple five gallon batches in their basement, and their friends are like, yeah, you should do that. My mm-hmm. family has done that to me and said, you should open a brewery, and I said, hell no. Yeah, now there's much more to it than just. Brewing good beer. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, they tell me that too. You'd open a restaurant. Hell no, I'm not opening a restaurant. <laughs> no, I have no desire to open a restaurant. Yeah. yeah just, Food truck, maybe. I yeah, can get away with that, just, but. Just because no. my house has a kitchen in it does not mean I'm qualified to own a restaurant. Oh, look at that fancy room. stove. You cook with. Ooh, yeah. gas. Well, to, to, <laughs> to go back to what you were saying about yeah. that honest feedback, I had this experience with a brewery that. A couple breweries will send me beer that I'll, I either write about it or I'll do a daily pour about it, but mm-hmm. I'm only sure to thank them. Oh, and yeah. if it's and if it's a beer that I just don't enjoy, I, I don't want to write that fluff piece, but I don't want to put it online and just tear it apart either. Because to me, there's probably someone out there that loves this beer. Oh, I've had that happen and several times. I actually yeah. contacted the brewery that sent me this beer. This is the deal. I've got this beer. I can do something to to review it, but mm-hmm. I don't feel comfortable saying what I really want to say. Because you guys have been great, you've sent me beer, and I'm happy to to give you some some press on it. Right. But this one just is not in my wheelhouse. And the response I got was, "Thank you for the honest feedback." Half of our staff hates that beer. <laughs> I was like, yeah. "Okay, good to know." And I, you know, especially when you go on Untapped or you go on Beer Advocate, and it was getting high reviews. The beer had an audience that enjoyed it. So who am I to come along and say, "Fuck you, you shouldn't drink this exactly. beer"? I didn't like it, so you shouldn't. So that beer never made press. It got dumped down the drain, and we moved on to the next one. But they appreciated me not going online saying, I would have elaborated. This is why I feel it tastes that way. But it, what would it have served? Yeah, what you, point exactly. would that have served? Now, you can reply back to them and, and give them more detail into it. But you, that's not, you have to think about also your audience. Like When you're, you're pointing out there, like, here's why I didn't like this beer, and just kind of end it with that. Uh, but if you want, you can also go to the brewer and say, okay, here's a more detailed reasoning because sometimes it's going to be over your, you have to, you know, your audience better than they do. You know how much detail you need to give them and what's going to be completely over their heads. There's a lot of times where and we got heat for this is because we simplified craft beer originally. And we did that because the people that we, we were going after to get into craft beer really doesn't give a shit about a lot of the nuances of craft beer. Like they, they don't care about a lot of the brewing process. Like we'll say like high level things that are going on with brewing. And Sick Puppy was a brewer for like 10 years before we even got started. So he knew the intricacies of, of brewing beer, whereas I was learning it. But that wasn't something we want to put on a show. Because to us, that was boring as hell to listen to. Mm-hmm. We want to say very high level of like, here's what you guys need to think about while you're looking at this beer. Now there's some things like color. You 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 got a uh, color. You're not going to object too much to what it looks. You're kind of limited. <laughs> like this is what the beer looks like. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're not going to pull out like an SRM table and, and compare it. Like there's no point to that. It, it might say it on the bottle. Fine. Whatever. But you say like, it's got like a, a ruby hue to it. All right, whatever. It's, or it's like a deep mahogany. Like people pretty much know what that's going to look like. If you pour that beer though, and it comes out, you know, yell wrong beer, or there's something <laughs> wrong with it. <laughs> But we noticed too, especially when talking about flavors, like there's only so many words you want to use because eventually you're you're going to lose somebody. Like they're not going to know what the hell you're talking about, and then they're going to zone out. And then you lost them for your show. Yeah. We want to keep it simple. And if you want a high tech show, go listen to one. There are so many shows out there that do that. Fantastic. The reason why we can have so many craft beer shows right now is because of the hosts, because of me, because of you, because of drinking partners, anybody else that's out there. It's People make a connection with the host. It's right. not so much. We all have pretty much the same beer reviews. At, brutally honest, we all talk about the same beers. At pretty much have the same experiences. It's listening to the person that's telling you about it and and what they're how they feel about that beer. But when it comes down to it, we're all drinking. Either you're going to be an asshole about it or a beer hole, or you could be a laid back guy and just say, "Hey." Here, here's what I think about it. You have somebody else, you talk to them. It, it's about not just the beer when it comes to a beer cr- podcast. It's about the entire experience. Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's one of those things I thought about, like, why do I listen to all these craft beer shows? Well, it's because there's something that I like about uh, how the host talks or the voice or there's so many different things. It's the guests that they bring in or, hey, they're talking about something local. 
I w- was, should I drink that right now? I was actually getting ready to record a show yesterday morning and when something came up, because life always happens now. <laughs> but it originally started out with the sick puppy and I sitting down talking about beers and people liked it. And we would have, we didn't really have too many guests, whatever. Uh, then when it was just me, it was like, okay, it's just me talking to a microphone, which I found boring as hell, but people were liking it. They said they still wanted to hear it. Fine. I'll talk into a microphone. Took that time off, came back and I'm like, you know what? I'm just, I'm going to do whatever I feel like doing. Now it, I do want feedback and I've gotten some really awesome feedback when I've asked for it. I had a guy send me, um, two emails and he also left me two voice, ma- two voicemails on the, the hotline and said, you know what I'd really like to hear from you? And he just laid it all out. I'm like, all right, I'll do it. And that's one of the things is I want, I want listener feedback. So it's, it's going to be me on a microphone talking for the foreseeable future. If I have guests in, tell me who you want to have in. I've got access to a studio where I can do that and Skype people in, but really it, it's going to be fan driven. Like what are, whatever you guys want to hear now. I, I'm at that point where I, I can be comfortable with saying, what, what do you want to do? And, and let's do it. And, you guys are still listening, so I'm doing something right, even if I'm not as bored as I was before because I'm just – I stopped giving a shit, really. Well, that's what I think it has to come down to. Now, with the Breaking Bruce podcast, this is actually – I should I mean, for those that don't know, and if you listen to the intro episode that I did before I started the interviews, I, I, I talked about this. We – or this, this is the second inter- incarnation of the Breaking Bruce podcast. The first one, known as the Breaking Bruce Power Hour podcast, didn't really take off the way I wanted it to, but – I was doing a lot of those solo episodes on my own. And you have to get to that point where you just stop giving a shit what people think. If they're going to listen to you, then awesome. And if it's just you, as long as the content that you put out there is digestible and and it makes sense and Mm -hmm. it's current, then I think there's a lot of value to that. So there's a few episodes of this show that I'll be doing solo. But for the most part, the, the, the point is to tap into the industry professionals that have experiences and and knowledge that can help all of you listening learn something about the various subjects that we're covering. So that's a great way to segue into wrapping up here. One question I wanted to ask you, Doug, is what are some tips that you would give to any aspiring podcasters out there, or even guys that have that are guys and girls that are rolling with a podcast but mm-hmm. are looking to make some improvements? Don't go in this with the sole intention of making money. <laughs> it's not happening, kids. I'm I'm sorry. Uh, well, to an extent, like, don't think that you're going to be like Mark Maron and have President Obama coming into your garage because that's, that's not happening. Be realistic with your expectations. If, if you're doing it, do it because you love craft beer and you love talking about it or actually podcasting in general, whatever your topic is. Uh, I'm starting to get into barbecue and it's, it's because it's something I love to do. So, you know, sit down and do it. But the main thing is listen to your fans, ask for feedback because, there's things that you may not know that you're doing that they pick up on. You're in their ears. You know, it's respect the fact that they are taking time out of their life to listen to your show. Like they could be listening to anybody else, but they're listening to your show at this moment. Uh, always, always respect the fans. And if they're jag offs to you, then, you know, hit block or something. <laughs> I don't know. Or uh, take that feedback and, mm. and use it to your advantage because yeah. I think it's the same Unless as Unless they're just screaming at you. Well, there's that. <laughs> That's what I like. Well, people. you'll have your trolls. I don't think there's any way around that. Oh, we've had a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I ended up becoming friends with one of them too. <laughs> Pulled a 180 on that guy. But when it, it comes to podcasting, definitely listen to, listen to a lot of other shows. I listen to a, a variety of topics, at least one or two episodes. If people say it's popular because I want to hear their style. I want to hear what they're doing that might be really good. Uh, be engaging, be socially active, because uh, that's that's the best way to get new fans is people sharing your content, uh, if possible. Eventually, you're gonna you can have a Patreon sign up where people can donate a dollar for every episode you publish. That's motivation to keep you going because really, when people are paying to cover your bar tab, it's kind of a nice thing. That that's the big thing is make sure you listen to your fans, listen listen to the feedback. Uh, don't be afraid to talk into a microphone. Unfortunately for me, I have to wait till my entire family is sleeping at like 1130 at night on a Saturday before I can record. But that that's what I have to do. And they can't even be in the same room as me. Like, even if they're quiet and watching Netflix, like I have to be, I have to be at myself 
you know, by myself at a table because I still have that sense of like, I don't want to say anything that's going to sound weird. And my wife comes in and goes, you sound like an idiot. Because it, <laughs> it, it messes with your flow. Like find out what your groove is and get yourself in that zone. Like this room is perfect for it. Yeah. That we're in because you could totally trick this out to be like well, and that's what, what, you, what you want. Well, once I have this this room that we are sitting and recording today looking the way I want, there will be a video element to this as well. So these podcasts will also appear on YouTube. But right now, it's so bare bones. There's things I need to do with the wall in regards to sound and flipping the room. Like we talked about, flipping yeah. the room. There's a lot that's going to happen. But yeah, I mean, this little room, I'd always wanted to do something with it. The only thing that sucks is being off the garage. It's cold right now. <laughs> got a heater in here. I got a little space heater, but yeah, that's all I've got. So, but the I don't, main, and I don't want to have that on while we're recording because right. I don't know what kind of noise that would generate in the background. The main thing to remember is that you're an artist. You're a creator. Do what may, don't listen to anybody else if they say you shouldn't do it that way because it's stupid. Uh, anytime that someone tells you something you're doing is stupid, fuck don't, them. Don't listen to them. Uh, now, <laughs> if they're saying it because they have feedback that could help you. Hey, that's great. But like, if this is how you get into a show, then, then great. Like before I start recording, I'll usually hit, and this is just my thing now is I'll drink a golden monkey before I record an episode because it loosens me up. I get relaxed. Otherwise I'll go in there and just because of how I am, I would, I would stress over like, do I have the show notes? Do I have this? Do I have that? It, it calms me down. I have the golden monkey. I can go into my show and let the flow go. Whatever it takes for you. If it's listening to music Find your happy place. That's a great way to say it. Find, find your happy place. Go to it and, and just record a great show. And and don't be afraid to the you know listen to criticism. That that's the best advice I could have is don't don't be afraid to listen to feedback and take it to heart. Nope. I think a tip that I can throw out there that's helped me when I get started, I will just turn the mic on and just talk. Whether like me and Doug before we actually started recording the show, there's probably, <laughs> probably about five or six minutes that. I could use as B-roll if there's anything memorable. But for the most part, get some shit flowing. And I'll even do that when I'm by myself because it helps me get into a mindset of, yeah. okay, I'll almost, it's like I'm cleaning out the garbage. I'm getting it out of my head, saying some things, and then flexing the pipes, almost like the you know, the arsonist has oddly shaped feet on Anchorman. <laughs> in fact, up until we started doing uh, Google Hangouts to record it because Sick Puppy was up in Cranberry and I was in Dormont, so we had it. We couldn't always go back and forth to each other's house, but when I we both lived in Cranberry, uh, our shows would be four hours long, four or five hours long, and we'd have to cut it down to an hour because that we found out that was that's the other thing too is find your sweet spot for your audience of how long they want to listen to you. Uh, a lot of should I drink that fans listen in long commutes or while they're at the gym, so an hour is perfect. What we found out was we would we would take that hour like we or we take the four hours, condense it down to an hour. And fans would get back to us and say, how'd you guys get drunk so fast? Because they would assume that we drank five beers in one hour. No, 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 no. <laughs> it wasn't the case. Well, what, a normal recording session for us would be I'd show up. Uh, we'd drink our beer. We'd bullshit. We'd drink a beer. We'd bullshit more. Watch a YouTube video. We'd get the munchies. I'd go cook something on a stove. We'd drink some more. we record. It's just we record the entire night. And we'd, but we'd sit down with – this is another good thing too is if you have a pad and a pen with you, write down – mark if you're using like Audacity, which you can't do too much editing on the fly, uh, just mark down times of like when you talk, start talking about certain things or like cut this out or like you start talking about this beer like – 10, 25, and start talking about this beer. Just so you have markers, because <laughs> listening to four hours of you guys bullshitting is, is not uh, fun. It's also a very large audio file, but I don't have that case now, but that's another thing to keep in mind, too, is sometimes, yeah, just let the mic go and and just talk and see what happens. And, yeah. and, yeah. and also, I will, like Doug had mentioned, listening to a variety of different podcasts. As you guys probably know, I, I took a couple years off from podcasting. I was doing a lot of other activities but i wasn't podcasting listening to a lot of other shows maybe it wasn't two years it was a, but it was an extended period mm -hmm. of time between shows i was listening to what the hosts were doing i was listening to their style it wasn't so much about the content of the show it was how they were delivering that content and it just it made me realize a lot of the, the ones that i was really digging were the ones where the hosts had something to say and they and they had some knowledge on the topic if you're just going to interview, 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 and that's the show you want to have, that's awesome. 
but just know it's going to be more about your guests than you. If you have some knowledge on your subject matter that you can sit and talk about in a very intellectual way, mm-hmm. and intellectual might be too broad of a word because, because depending on the subject matter, that might be too much to, to stomach. But the point I'm driving at is you really want to go into an episode knowing something about what your guest is going to talk about so you can have a conversation about it because the the better podcasts that I found were the ones where ghost wasn't just, okay, you got done talking, here's another question. And I think if you even listen to this show on certain episodes, either in the past or going forward, there will be time to some degree. And I'm going to let that guest come in. They're going to have yeah. way more knowledge on a subject than I'm going to. Like if we ever talk about dissolved oxygen on a podcast episode here, that's where that's one where I'll, I will give myself a briefing, but I'm going to let the host really drop the knowledge bomb and tell us what we need to know about dissolved oxygen. That's an extreme example, but... Yeah, I think that can that, well, that can be very powerful if you if you know a lot of, or know a good amount about what you're talking about with your guest. And that's what makes podcasting fun for you as a host and for anybody listening as a host is it is about you, but there's also time for you to learn things and I think people enjoy hearing that like okay, I really want to know about the subject, teach me. Teach me and everyone else. Now, you yeah, you can be the subject matter, you know, the shmi, I think it's what they got the SME, SME the expert on that subject, but no one's expecting you to know everything about everything. You're going to learn eventually. I mean, it's, I'm constantly Correct. learning new things. I, I, I'll go over to Sorgatron Media and talk to Sorg about some ideas, and he bounces some off me, and we're like, this. he does a lot of live things, so I talked to him about how I could film live, live barbecue events. What do I need to know? Just simple things like that, which I think would also make a good episode for somebody who wants to get into recording outside live. Yeah. Because if now if you're a beer podcaster and you're listening to me talk to someone who records live, you're now going to get insight on how if you could go to beer fest. So it's you pick up things from everywhere. Don't ever think that you're the least on any kind of subject that's out there. Yeah. Always be willing to learn. And we've talked about this a couple times already, but that mm-hmm. feedback is very valuable. Mm-hmm. And especially for another person that's in digital media or even written media that's connected to the industry mm-hmm. and, and they've got some pointers that you may be able to incorporate, you may find that some of them work for you. You may find that some don't, but always be willing to listen because you never know what's going to come along that helps you improve your show. Exactly. There you go. Do Doug, what makes you happy, we just, man. We were like, about an hour and a half episode, and Doug just shit all over the whole point. <laughs> 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 fuck it. Just do whatever. Fuck it. Do whatever you want. <laughs> Oh, you man. know what? I don't give a shit. I'm done. Mic drop. Yep. You see, you get two podcast <laughs> veterans sitting in the room talking to all you guys that are just getting started. We and solved just... all the world's problems <laughs> and then said, you know what? Fuck it. Yeah. You know We're what? Done. You do you. Show over. Doug, man, thanks a lot. <laughs> I, I, I know we were going to have to do this again because we talked. This is our longest episode so far. And I think that um, we've still got a lot to talk about. Take that, Reed. But... <laughs> But, dude, thanks a lot, man. Lots of great knowledge for all podcasts off the ground or you're thinking about starting one. There are lots of ways to do it. Hopefully this episode was a nice resource for you to pick back on the show to wrap about a lot of other topics down the road. I'd love to get into that whole live recording deal it's at fun. some point, too. It, it's, it, I've done a few of those, and they're, they're a lot of fun. They're also a logistic nightmare. Yeah. Because there's so many variables. But, yeah, that's a whole nother, yeah, that's, yeah, that's topic, a whole nother beast. Topic for another day. In fact, day. we should probably get Sorg in for that. Well, not my, I was just going to say the same thing. We should take a field trip up to Sorgatron yeah. Media and let him be the one that educates. So we'll bring that to you guys in the future. Doug, thanks again, man. All of the Breaking Brews podcast is officially in the history books. I'd like to take this opportunity one more time to thank Mr. Doug Durda for joining me in the studio to rap about beer podcasting and all manner of beer talk. If you'd like to check out Should I Drink That, jump over to wherever you listen to podcasts and search Should I Drink That. You can also check out Should I Drink That on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. I will have links for those in the show notes so you guys can follow Doug and all of his beer adventures. One thing we didn't get an opportunity to jump into, and I'll have to bring Doug back again to talk about this, is barbecue, which is something he is big into these days. Uh, He has a platform called Yin's Love Barbecue or Yin's Love BBQ. You can find that on social media as well. Not sure if we'll be seeing a beer and barbecue combination podcast down the road from Doug, 
but a boy can dream. We'll see what happens in the future. So once again, should I drink that? Great podcast. All right, guys, in the next session of the Breaking Brews podcast, I'm going to be joined by Mr. Andrew Copeland of Secret Hopper. Andrew and his wife put together a really thorough, kick-ass program that allows brewery owners to maximize the success of what's happening within their four walls. Secret Hopper is a service that's very similar to a secret shopper. They send folks into breweries undercover to evaluate a lot of different aspects and criteria, all of which lead to the ultimate customer experience. And brewery owners and managers can take advantage of this to evaluate their staff, determine where their strengths and weaknesses are. And me and Andrew are going to go into detail about how his program works, how brewery owners and managers can utilize this data to improve their practices, and ultimately what it takes to create that ultimate customer experience with a tap room. A lot of good stuff ahead next week for session 17. Hope you guys are ready. Once again, if you haven't done so, subscribe to the show over at iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or Spotify. Drop a rating and review. Let me know how I'm doing with the show. And stay up to date on everything about Breaking Brews over at Breaking Brews Co. on Instagram and Twitter. Also, look up Breaking Brews on Facebook and follow all the great content I have coming from Breaking Brews over at BreakingBrews.com. That's a wrap for Session 16, boys and girls. I am Jason Sircone. We'll be back next week. And until then... This has been the Word of the Poured.